When Europe in the 19th century faced rapid change, it was a time of endless warfare as the kingdom tried to protect itself from inside and outside threats. It was during this time as well that the country's first standing army was created. The Abarusra, they were called, descended upon their enemies armed to the teeth with firearms. But even before the creation of the Abarusra, when Euro kings used armies called Awesengse. In today's episode, we talk about Bunyoro's pre-colonial military and warfare. Starting with recruitment. As far as I can tell, there are two ways of putting together an army in the pre-colonial society of Bunyoro. The first one involved the king telling his chiefs that he wanted to go to war. If they agreed with his crusade, the chiefs would in turn call upon their men from the territories that they ruled. Men were selected by leaving an arrow at their house. When the men woke up in the morning, they knew that they had been enlisted for war. Historian G.N. Nozoigwe tells us that they had no choice but to accept. This was, of course, done in secret, so as not to alert the population of impending war. These armies were called Obwesengese, which is a Luganda word, by the way, not Runyoro. But Manyoro used it to mean a personal possession with all rights of disposal. Basically, to fully own something like land, and in this case, an army. And they were mostly loyal to the chief whose area they came from. This is one of the reasons why rebellion happened a lot more often in Bunyoro than it did in Buganda. Bunyoro had a decentralized system with chiefs having more authority. So, chiefs could decide not to participate in a king's war. But this usually put them on his naughty list. You can imagine that no one wanted to be the only chief saying no. Unless, of course, there were multiple objectors. There's always strength in numbers. And indeed, the Owesengze chiefs objected to Kabaleg's expansionist wars on the grounds that they were too risky. But of course, they were soundly ignored, because at the time, most of his military needs were met by his new army called the Abarusra. In order to curb potential rebellions from the chiefs, Bunyoro kings required them to stay at the palace, as we discussed in episode 9 of the podcast series. If they had to leave for any reason at all, they had to make a formal request. Now, the second way was much more loud and dramatic. In the event of an incoming attack, the war drum Kaijuire would be sounded by the chiefs of the regalia men, and all the men who heard that drum were expected to assemble at the king's palace. This all happened very quickly, and before you knew it, men from all over appeared armed and ready. The explorer Samuel Baker, who had the bitter experience of tasting defeat at the hands of the Renoro, was impressed with how quickly people were able to come together. In addition to sounding the drum, several messengers would be dispatched to further lands to let them know that their service was required. And once they had their men, the king would select his Mugabe, his general, and they would swear an oath of fidelity to him. They would then be given a spear, shield, and special fetishes slash talismans for their protection. He then had to leave the capital without spending the night there. It was vital that he did this lest, well, something bad happened. The Banyoro had a lot of taboos. His men would then prepare by sharpening their spears and making shields. Banyoro soldiers were said to often have two spears, one for throwing, which they could throw up to 50 yards with accuracy, and another for close quarters combat. Some of these spears might have had poison on them. In one of the Chitara epics, it's said that an assassin lay in wait for Ndahura with a poison spear. The man lost his courage and confessed, only for Ndahura to headbutt him to death with the horns on his head. When it comes to bow and arrows, the Banyoro didn't really use them, uh, but they did employ groups that did. However, Samuel Baker did say that he had been shot at with arrows that were coated in a poisonous gummy matter, and that he suspected that they came from Mogungo district of Banyoro because none of the others used the bow. So some Banyoro did. For protection, John Roscoe tells us that they used shields made of a soft wood that hardened with exposure. These shields were leaf-shaped, 18 inches wide, and 2 to 2.5 feet long. They had a boss in the middle, which were covered with laced or plated reeds. With this, their bodies were covered, and they were capable of paring away spear thrusts and arrows. To further protect them, soldiers would wear multiple fetishes or amulets, which were given to them by medicine men that they would see before going off to war. Roscoe said that they would be covered in these things some of their necks, some of their wrists, and some on their shields, 
Charms feature heavily in the cultures of the Great Lakes. They were considered vital to one's survival on the battlefield and also their everyday lives, just like the story behind this tune. Just listen. This tune tells of a Muganda chief called Kangaho who'd wear his charm as a headband all day. At night, he would take it off and hang it on the wall. But alas, one day, somebody stole it. And without his protective charm, the chief soon died. The end. The lesson being here, I assume, don't go around stealing people's charms or else you'll end up condemning them to death. In the past, kings used to lead their soldiers into battle. It isn't clear when that changed exactly, but there is a Bunyoro rule that stipulates that kings must never shed blood. To do so would preclude you from the kingship. Now, Zoyga and Roscoe tell us that this was due to the expansion of the empire. The land they governed became too large for them to always be marching off to war. And so most of the fighting was done by the chiefs. Each of these chiefs had a personal drum which was a symbol of their power and authority. Their goal was to not only defeat the enemy, but to capture their drum. Having your drum seized was considered a huge disgrace, and so chiefs would go to great lengths to protect their drums. Such was the case with the Bamuli clan. Their drum was called Rusama. During the transition from the Second Dynasty to the Third Dynasty, the Babito managed to subjugate Wamara of the Bamuli clan, but failed to capture his drum, Rusama. This meant that the Bamuli were actually still in active rebellion, even though they had lost. Basically, you have my surrender, but you don't really have me, if you know what I mean. As I've said in previous episodes, clans existed in opposition to the kingship. Some, like the Bamuli, chose to engage in a quiet contest of power. Now, some chiefs would bring their wives to the warfront. Their duties were to treat them, feed them, and accomplish all of the domestic chores that were expected of them. The other reason for bringing them along was to uh, keep an eye on them, because it was believed that if disaster fell upon the man on the battlefield, it must be because his wife had been unfaithful. Yeah, oof. When I read this, I could only imagine the number of women that were unreasonably accused of being unfaithful. It's quite sad. But as far as battle goes, they were not allowed to see the fighting. That being said, when your historian Yolam Musamba talks of female warriors who belong to religious cults such as Muchwez Nyinamwiru, Python priestess of Chisangwe. Her followers fought on the battlefield against King Kamrasi in the 1850s. They had hoped to stop his rebellion against his brother Rakabali. And of course, there were others as well, such as Kakubia, priestess of Atenichijo Kachamuzizi of Nyakabimba, Kugere, serpent priestess of Ndioko of Busongora, Chitamicha Nyawera of Mpororo, and Nyangoma, among others. These female priestesses would not only fight physically, but use sorcery to fight their enemies as well. An example is Nyabuzana, who I talked about in the previous episode. She was said to bewitch her enemies and advise the Nkore King Mutambuka on when it was appropriate to attack. You see, this was a very important role in Bunyoro warfare. Kings and generals relied on the council of medicine men and women who would make auguries to see into the future. Before and after every battle, every general would send offerings to the god of war Mohingo. His priest was never allowed to appear before the king. And as part of their sorcery powers, in the event of an invading army, these medicine men would prepare a sacrifice of a blind animal and bury it in the pass where the army was supposed to pass. This apparently served to ruin the powers of perception of the army when they stepped on the places where the stuff had been buried. This was a form of spiritual and psychological warfare that would absolutely terrify their enemies. It's said that in 1894, Captain Thruston and his Sudanese soldiers were shaken when they found witchcraft items on the road to their fort in Hoima. But as much as priests engaged in war, they also provided safe havens for those seeking shelter. Bunyoro rules of war dictated that anyone seeking shelter at shrines would be spared. An example of this was during the rebellion of Mutrezi Kagoro. He unleashed terror upon his fellow Mutrezi leaders. Many of them fled to shrines and temples. Others didn't make it, and they were drowned en masse in Lake Albert. 
I talked about this in episode four. Many of the bodies floated in the lake, and this image of dead Batrezi was forever stamped in the psyche of the Banyoro people. Other than that, the Banyoro also utilized spies to do reconnaissance before a battle. They would send people disguised as merchants selling salt, food, and other items. As they carried on their duties, they would collect information about the place, such as food stores, weak points, and the people's schedule. Some of those sent to do the spying were priestesses who used their reputation and sexuality to influence the enemy. Nyamate is such an example, who according to legend, left her husband Isaza the king of Wanyoro suddenly while pregnant to go back to his enemy, her father Nyamnyonga. Nsamba says that she was spying for her father, and indeed her father did ask her, what does he love the most? Listen to the story in episode 2 of the podcast series. But by the late 1800s, the Abwesengazi armies were no longer the main military in the country. They were replaced by the Abarusra. You are a friend of mine. You are not a friend of my spear. That is a Abarusura war slogan. The Abarusura were Wunyoro's first standing army that was put together by Umkama Kabarega in the 1870s. They traced their origins to the time of his father Kamrasi when they were his personal bodyguards. Kamrasi even deployed them to protect the explorer Samuel Baker, who insultingly called them his satanic escort. Now, to be fair, he was a bit startled by the grand entrance they made. They came out and circled him, making mock attacks at his group. Let's read what he had to say. Open quotes. The entire group was most grotesquely got up, being dressed in either leopard or white monkey skins, with cow's tails strapped on behind and antelope's horns fitted upon their heads, while their chins were ornamented with full spears made of the bushy ends of cow's tails sewed together. Although I've never seen a more unearthly set of creatures, they were perfect illustrations of my childish ideas of devils, furnished by Kamrasi to accompany us to the lake. (laughs) He's he's so incredibly dramatic. But at the time, on top of protecting the king Kamrasi, they acted as royal messengers, pageantry, and kept order at public assemblies. By 1872, they had grown to about a thousand men strong, according to the explorer Samuel Baker. They then continued to grow large enough that by 1891, there were 10 units with about 2,000 men each. The Abarusra were set upon Bunyoro's neighbors in an effort to recreate the emperor of their forebears, Chitara. And indeed, they succeeded in reconquering the breakaway province of Toro and managed to reassert their influence in other groups, such as the northern portion of Busoga. These military units were headed by commanders who were handpicked by Kabalega. According to the historian Shane Doyle, the most successful Barusra were those who combined loyalty to Kabalega with political, military, and economic flair. And indeed, many of them occupied positions of economic importance, were chiefs and military leaders. Of the ten generals of the Abarusra, four were the most famous along with their units. These were Rabudongo, Ireta, Chukukule, Nyakamatura, and his son, Biabatrezi. We're going to talk about the lives of these men, because these guys were incredibly important to the sustainability of Bunyoro's military in the late 19th century. Number 1. Military Unit Echihambia. Commander Rabudongo. Rabudongo was Bunyoro's most famous murusura, a commoner, he was sent as a page by a senior chief to Kabalega's court. There he became a favorite of Kabalega, who recognized not only his fighting skills, but his business acumen as well. As such, he was given control of the ivory and arms trade. Rabudongo was responsible for the acquisition and distribution of Bunyora's great hordes of ivory and the allocation of firearms, a position which earned him considerable influence and power despite not being a chief. He was so close to Kabalega that people incorrectly referred to him as Kabalega's katikiro, or prime minister, something that the actual prime minister probably didn't appreciate. 
His closeness to the king might explain why his military unit at Jihambia was stationed near the palace. He was also very close to Kabalega's son and fellow Murusara general, Jasi. The two of them even entered into a blood brotherhood with each other. Rabudongo was described by the British Commissioner Berkeley as intelligent and sincere, whereas the administrator George Wilson saw him as exceedingly cunning and a clever man of the Swahili school. Rabudongo was a reliable figure in Kapalega's wars against his enemies. From the Battle of Rengabi in 1886, where the Banyoro horribly humiliated the Baganda, to the multiple altercations with the British. But these wars with the British came to take a toll on him, as it eventually did with the others. He was a fugitive in his own country. He was subject to numerous raids where his houses and crops were constantly being burned down. In a letter to the commissioner, Major J.F. Cunningham wrote, open quotes, the policy used against recalcitrant chiefs was that which proved successful with Rabadongo, continuous patrols and burning of their houses, close quotes. In late 1894, after a year-long massive invasion by the Anglo-Ganda army led by Colville, Kabalega asked for peace. Major Thruston granted a three-month truce while they figured out how they were going to accept the king's surrender. A little prior to this, Rabudongo was said to begin to take on a position of neutrality. He would not attack the British, and he would not fight against his king by collaborating. This is, of course, according to Edward Steinhardt in his book Conflict and Collaboration. With this, Rabudongo hoped to avoid reprisals from both sides. Now, during this truce phase in January 1895, Kabalega apparently sent word to Rabudongo to provide a contribution of 50 tusks of ivory towards the payment to the British that he was going to make. Thruston had told him that they may ask for ivory as part of his surrender. Mm -hmm. Now, in response, according again to a letter to the commissioner from Cunningham, Rabudongo said, and I quote, I am not a woman and I will not make peace. This is what he said to his king, apparently. He then proceeded to attack the kingdom of Toro, which was under the protection of the British Empire. In this alleged attack, he was said to have been joined by the other commanders, such as Ireta and Chikukule, with a force of 1,300 guns. Three of them then declared that they were not going to follow Kabalega's orders anymore. This attack was the match that blew up the truce. The British saw this as an act of betrayal and proof of Kabalega's treacherous nature. Another massive attack was planned with a force of 20,000 Baganda, 5,000 with guns, several hundred Sudanese, two Hotchkiss cannons, and several Maxim guns. Now, the historian Jane Doyle tells us that there was no corroborating evidence to support this alleged attack on Toro. But according to D.A. Lowe in his book Fabrication of Empire, he said, while it wasn't an attack per se, there was a clash. According to him, Rabudongo was in the area, but he was there to secure a safe route for traders from the south, probably Karagwe or Nyamwezi traders. Unfortunately, the Batoro did not take kindly to him being there, and as a result, conflict ensued. The takeaway from this is that it wasn't a betrayal of the truce by Kabalega and Rabudongo. According to Doyle, this was a plot by the Batora and the Baganda who were eager to see the downfall of their enemy, so they decided to feed the British false information. It also didn't align with the motives of Rabudongo. Rabudongo was known to be in favor of pursuing peace with the British, all the way back to the time of Lugard. In fact, Rabudongo objected to Kabalega's plans for war with Lugard. It was said that he also opposed the attack on the British fort in Hoima in August 1894. This was Bunyoro's largest attack against the invaders, and it failed miserably. So such things caused arguments between Rabudongo and his king. Adding to this, he had suffered several losses against Baganda troops and lost about 80 of his followers. Rabudongo was dispirited, and so in May 1895, he surrendered. His submission was the first of all the commanders, and soon after him, others followed, giving the British hope that their strategy of harassing the commanders was working. With this, they believed that they'd be able to turn all of Kabalega's chiefs against him and bring the war to an end. This wasn't as successful as it seemed, and we'll see when I talk about the others. Now, 
Robert Ongo didn't just submit himself to the British. He specifically went to Toro and surrendered to Prince Kasagama. Why would he do this? Well, the thinking must have been that he, that if he couldn't serve his king, Kabalega, then perhaps it meant something if he submitted to another movie to royal. That way, he must have felt that he wasn't submitting to the foreigners, but rather to one of his own, despite them being enemies. But whatever his thoughts must have been, this choice <laughs> turned out to be the incorrect one for him. You see, Prince Kasagama of Toro was all too familiar with the destruction caused by the Abarusura. He was a boy when they attacked his home and made him a fugitive in 1876. Kasagama and his relatives became fugitives in Nkore, where he narrowly escaped an assassination. And here in his custody, he had the number one Murusura, Rabadogo. What do you think he did? Kasagama couldn't kill Rabadongo because the British were the ones who were really in charge, and they needed him. As part of British policy for defectors, especially to high-value targets like Rabadongo, he was offered a position of chief of Nyangabo in Toro. And whoo, oh man, this, th th this territory that was given to him was part of Kasagama's uh, chieftaincies. Kasagama did not react well to this. And so he resolved to make his life an absolute hell. This was the beginning of Kasagama's bad blood with the British captain Ashburnham, who was in charge of Toro. And that's a story for another day. But Rabadongo went to Captain Ashburnham and complained about the prince's mistreatment and apparent childishness. For example, one thing that Kasagama apparently did was that he stole from Rabadongo. He stole his cows, he stole his women, and among other things. It got so bad that Rabadongo decided to leave and go to Buganda where he was welcomed with open arms. Now, talks were had that the territory of Chaka, which used to belong to Bunyoro and had been given to Toro, was now going to be given to Buganda. <laughs> okay. And to add to that, that territory of Chaka was going to be ruled over by Rabadongo. Literally fuel over the fire, Kasagama's discontentment was intensified. He sent a representative to Kampala to plead his case. And you know what? They actually listened. Rabadongo was removed. He then found himself in the political wilderness of the county of Nyakabimba. A truly wasted opportunity for the British to utilize an important asset like Rabadongo. And given how he had been treated, it's no surprise that he did the very bare minimum to help them. In 1896, they tried again and offered him a much better position, only for them to then become convinced that he was actually a double agent by the likes of Chiefs Piawatrezi and Amara. Both were rewarded with Rabadongo's territory. Once again, he was demoted. For the third time. Unfortunately, Rabadongo had to deal with a lot of suspicion due to how close he had been to the king. This led to confusion over what to do with him. Now, D.A. Lowe tells us that Rabadongo never went back to Kavalega. However, E.C. Lanning says that he actually went back to fighting against the British in 1898. That was around the time of the Sudanese mutiny, and it seemed like the British might lose. In any case, he was later brought back in 1899 as part of an executive council of three to look after Kavalega's son. Colonel Evett then made him Katikiro, Prime Minister of Munyoro, a position he held until his death in 1900. Interestingly, though, Lanning indicates that Robodongo died after a dispute with the Abitrezi over who was more important. Hmm. Number two, military unit... Echiruana, Commander Ireta Biangome. This unit was responsible for the protection of the Western Front, the Congo border. Now, Ireta was actually a Munyankore from the neighboring kingdom of Nkore. He was captured during the succession war after the army that he was leading was defeated. Kabalega took a liking to him, and he soon became one of Kabalega's fiercest supporters. This was, of course, helped by the fact that Ireta was actually a pretty well known spiritual medium. If you listen to episode 11, you know how much power mediums had in Bunyoro. As such, Kabalega also made him a chief on top of him being a military general. In terms of commanders, Ireta was considered number two, second to Rabadongo. 
he was considered a very brave man and because of that participated in many of Kaudeka's wars. However, despite his bravery, he also became disillusioned by what seemed like an endless war with the British. He agreed with Rabudongo and opposed Kabalega's decision to continue war with Lugard. Yakatura wrote that both Ireta and Rabudongo did not hide their anger over this decision. In July 1895, after Rabudongo had surrendered, Ireta followed suit. But this didn't last long, because Ireta soon went back to Kabalega. Going by Rabudongo, it was probably due to mistreatment. Doyle explains that British expectations of chiefs who had defected were unrealistically high. Many of them were treated with suspicion and thus failed to properly woo them to their side. As a result, a lot of chiefs opted to play a double hand when dealing with the British. They also thought that it would be a good idea to test the loyalty of these chiefs by having them work as road builders. <laughs> okay, Mwanike Mekono, raise your hands if you can tell me why this was not a good idea. Mm-hmm, right. So Ideta continued fighting against the British even after Kabalega had been caught in 1899. A trusted and devoted follower to the end, Ideta only surrendered when Kabalega sent orders asking him to. After much deliberation, he agreed, despite many of his followers initially opposing his decision. He surrendered in Masindi, in Bunyara territory, and his guns were taken away. The British arrested him and threw him in a jail cell in Kampala. Ireta was eventually tried for his participation in the war. Imagine that. He won his case, though, and it was agreed that he would be treated as a prisoner of war instead of a rebel, which, if it was decided that he was a rebel, he would have been shot. He was kept in Buganda where he was given land and converted to Christianity. The name given to him was Stanley. Ireta died in 1910. Number 3 Military Unit Echibanja Commander Chukukure Runego The Echibanja unit was tasked with the defense of the border between Buganda and the Bunyoro province of Bugangaisi, one of the eventual six lost counties. Chukukure was a Muganda by birth. His father had fled to Bugangaisi during the Bunyoro Succession War for unknown reasons. He unfortunately died, leaving the young Chukukure on his own. However, the young boy caught the attention of the chief of Bugangaisi, who took him under his wing and protected him. His incredible fighting abilities helped him rise through the ranks and eventually become the chief of Bugangaisi himself. Chukukule became rich and powerful, mostly due to the fact that his territory of Bugangaisi was on the way to Zanzibar on the coast, and in order for the traders to pass through, he had the right to tax them. The position of his territory made him an important target to the British who considered him a threat to Buganda. This also messed with their invasion strategy because Chikukule's warriors blocked them from the southwest. Lastly, knowing that Kabalega was trying to meet up with Chikukule, the British set out to stop this by any means. So the solution was to entice Chikukule to leave Kabalega in the same way that Toro had done with Bunyoro. Failing to realize that the Toro situation was completely different than Chikukure, they began to whisper sweet nothings into his ear and saying, Imagine you could have a territory of your own, unbeholden to anyone. But, but us, of course. Major Owen eventually struck an agreement with Chikukule that he would provide his garrison with food, which they desperately needed. Now, <laughs> would it surprise any of you that Chikukule had no intention of fulfilling his obligations? He apparently dragged his feet like a prisoner with a chain ball attached to his ankle, evading and procrastinating his obligations, offering a litany of excuses which I would have loved to read. Oh, where is Chikukule? We were supposed to have food two days ago. I don't know why I'm doing it in a high-pitched voice, but... <laughs> Only for them to respond, well... Well, you see, he moves around, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere, and then he's nowhere at all. The British got the message loud and clear. This evasive approach, coupled with Kabalega's attacks on Toro around the same time, angered them <laughs> very much. Major Colville accused Chikukule of denying them food. On top of that, he also accused him of attacking friendly natives that supplied the British with food and for hostile demonstrations at their fort. Chikukule, with his 2,000 guns and a reinforcement of 4,000 guns from Kabalega, were then attacked by Major Owens and defeated. This was a considerable loss for Chikukule, whose son died in the process. 
along with 70 of his men. I should note that it took three hours of hard fighting till Major Owen was able to force Chikukure to retreat. This was in the year 1893. He continued to fight against them until October 1895, when he eventually surrendered. But his loyalty, like Ireta, was never fully secured, because the British decided to, <laughs> get this, publicly flog him and reduce him to the position of a peasant. After such a humiliation, there was no way that he was going to help them the way they wanted him to. Chikukule lay in wait pretending to go along with things until the opportune time to switch sides came in 1897. He did so like many of his fellow Abarusra. His final surrender was after the capture of Cabrega in 1899. It's said that when he was captured, he showed signs of age and of having experienced hardships for some time. Shikukure died of a fever on September 10th, 1899. Number 4. Military Unit Echibari Commander Nyakamatura. Ichibari was stationed at the heart of the country, the capital. Nyakamatura was the only chief that supported Kabalega in the beginning of the succession war. These two had been very good friends for a long time. And just like Kabalega had to fight for his place, so too did Nyakamatura, who actually started out as a slave. He was a member of the Bairu class, the agriculturalists, but by proving himself, he was able to rise through the ranks and became at the time Wunyoro's only chief of Muiru origin. This along with his friendship were strong reasons why he supported Kabalega throughout the years. He was a successful military general. His loyalty was rewarded with the position of Prime Minister of Wunyoro in 1887, after his predecessor was poisoned. Unfortunately, Nyakamatura died in 1893. He was then succeeded by his son, Biabatrezi. Now, this man, Biabatrezi, is a very, very interesting character. He was a good military general, but had a tendency to oversell his military victories. The British came to know of him after an attack on Fort Baranwa on the Kafa River, currently located in Jibale District in western Uganda. The fort was attacked on March 6, 1894, with an estimated force of about 200 guns. On May 6, 1894, Biabatrezi's forces attacked a caravan with supplies from Uganda that were headed to Major Thruston. This frustrated Thruston, who recognized that Biabatrezi was a threat to their supply lines and must be eliminated. Biabatrezi's forces camped at a hill called Musai Jamkuru, with a flat top and steep hills. The hill was known in Bunyoro history as being unassailable. In fact, it was said that the Abarusra would roll down boulders from the top of the hill onto their enemies. However, on the 20th of May, 1894, Major Thruston destroyed that reputation when he and his troops reached the top and killed the Munyora defenders. This attack was carried out in collaboration with the Munyora chief Amara. Kabalega lost his son in the attack, and for his betrayal, years later, Amara was assassinated. Now, Biabatrezi survived this assault and was reportedly the first one to flee. He later met up with Kabarega in preparation for Bunyoro's biggest attack against the British. All of the major commanders were there. The aim was to attack the British fort at Hoima. This is the uh, attack that I told you about before. And as I said before, it was a massive failure, despite them having the numbers advantage. That fort was just very well defended. It's situations like these that began to frustrate Yabatrezi along with the Abarusura as we have seen. A year later, in July 1895, he surrendered. Now, unlike the other commanders who gave themselves up, Yabatrezi really fit this role of a British collaborator. He reaped the benefits and helped the British conquer much of the country. In fact, after the dust settled after the war, he ended up with the largest piece of territory over all the other chiefs. The British came to believe that Biabuchezi was actually terrified of Kabalega, and that he would make any excuse in the book to avoid seeing him, including saying that, oh, he was ill, and he would even run away into the wilderness when he was called upon. And so apparently, Kabalega would punish him for this by being forced to do the hardest of all the tasks. <laughs> This is so obviously absurd, but it, it served Biabatrezi well to have them believe this. They pitied him and trusted him more, and he became the first Bunyoro Christian chief and was given the name Paul or Paulo in Uganda. 
Yavachesi was the darling of the Anglican missionaries, who actually wanted him to be the Katikido, or Prime Minister of Bunyoro, over Abudogo after the war. A sentiment that was echoed by colonial administrator George Wilson, who recognized his devotion to Anglicanism, tea parties, and the typewriter as marks of a model chief. Wilson stated that Yavachesi was, as far as any native, fairly to be credited with honesty of purpose. What? He couldn't help but lace that with a backhanded compliment. Wilson also called him a less talented individual, but was he, though? Was he? Yabuchezi was great at playing the game. As a matter of fact, when he surrendered, he had been sent by Kabalega to find out what the terms of peace would be for him. Steinhardt argues that there was evidence that Kabalega had allowed his chiefs, including Yabuchezi, to submit in an effort to avoid having Baganda chiefs installed in their places. Anything to avoid Baganda taking over. He also wanted them to act as a sort of lobbying group to convince the British to restore him as king. What Steinhardt is suggesting here is that Biabutrezi was probably a double agent, or at least initially started off as such. But that didn't really work out, given that his efforts helped the British much more than they did Kabalega. Biabutrezi was really looking out for himself. It was actually speculated that he had stolen a lot of Kabalega's property, and therefore it was in his best interest to make sure that he never, ever becomes king again. Now, for all the criticisms of Yabutrezi's collaboration, he was heavily involved in the Nyangile Rebellion of 1907. While Yabutrezi was punished for this, it was a slap on the wrist considering the extent of his participation. He lost one-third of his land and was fined 500 pounds. In comparison to the others, who some were exiled, others suffered a reduction in annual pay, others were deposed altogether. Wilson, who was in charge of doling out the punishments, believed that the only reason Biabutrezi was involved was because he wasn't courageous enough to stop it. (laughs) Okay, little did he know that the other chiefs actually called him their prime minister. Even James Mati in Uganda sent to teach the Banyora how to rule, with quotation marks, accurately pointed him out as the ring leader. Biabutrezi died in 1911. Despite being considered a traitor, I think he was simply a man trying to find a way to survive in a rapidly changing society. In this case, the statement, don't hate the player, hate the game, applies more accurately. Together, the Abarustra military units were responsible for the protection of the state from inside and outside threats. They answered to their commanders, and to the commander-in-chief Kabalega, the king. If he was absent, he would appoint someone in his place. This person was called Engabwa Yamukama, the supreme commander of general. He was given a string of beads which he wore around his neck to represent his office. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that some of the commanders, like Ideta and Chikukule, were not Bonyoro. That's because the Abrusura were not only made up of Banyoro, but of Banyankore, Lango, Acholi, Baganda, Bari, Basoga, Alur, Madi, Sudanese soldiers from the Equatorial Egyptian Empire, and Arabs as well. In fact, one of Kabalega's chief advisors was a Zanzibari Arab called Abed Reham. To be clear though, Doyle pointed out that Buganda also had a multi-ethnic army, but unlike Bunyoro, the European observers didn't have a problem with it. The Abrusara were constantly accused of being made up mostly of foreign mercenaries. Yet the reality was that this was more in line with Mugnora's tradition of alliances with their neighbors, especially the Lango. Okay, let's talk about how they dressed. The Abrusara commanders were quite distinguished from the foot soldiers. According to Uzoigwe, they were entayomba, which were made of expensive animal skins which were properly and carefully prepared. And this is backed up by Shane Doyle, who says the Banyoro stitched animal skins and bark cloths comparable to the work of a 19th century English needlewoman. Over the Entayomba, they wore what was called embuera, a sort of coat which was made of soft leather. Some even wore kanzus with their attire, which were garments bought from the Arabs. Around their waist, they wore ichsikri, a kind of ammunition belt, which also had attached to it a knife sword. The rest of the foot soldiers wore less expensive animal skins. 
Now for weapons, it was said that the Abrusara were armed with the common rifles of the day, your breech loaders, Remingtons, Sharps, Winchesters, Snyders, Henry Martinis, Joyce Linen Star, and double-barreled large-bore game rifles. Kabalaga even had a personal gun that was called Baguigai de Bata. It was a repeating rifle capable of firing up to 17 shots. Historian Chris Pierce tells us that it was probably a Winchester gun, and they had a lot of guns far more than Kamarazi had in his time. An estimate in the 1880s puts the number of guns in Kabalaka's possession at 1,800. This, Ozoigwe assures us, is a conservative estimate. Given the number of soldiers in the Abrusana army and the fact that most had guns, and you can kind of see why, and research shows that between 1885 and 1902, approximately 1 million guns, more than 4 million pounds of gunpowder, millions of caps, and rounds of ammunition entered the East African interior. Now, no one knows how much of that went to the Banyoro, but we do know that they were more than capable of paying for it. In the late 1860s, Kabaka Mutesa of Buganda had refused the Zanzibar Arabs from trading with Banyoro, since they had come in contact with Buganda first, and if they wished to continue the trade that they had with them, they had to respect his wishes. However, that changed when Kabalega offered them five times what they were getting anywhere else. If it cost one ivory tusk for one gun in Buganda, Kabalega gave them five tusks for one gun. This proved far too lucrative for them to ignore. And with that, the embargo was broken. They also paid for their guns with slaves that they procured from neighboring kingdoms. These slaves were sold to the Zanzibaris and the Khartoum Arabs as well. They would then be sent off to the coast or as far away as Egypt and off to the Middle East. It's safe to say that they had far more than 1,800. In fact, Colville estimated that they had about 8,000 guns and 20,000 spearmen. All right, let's talk about their reputation, effectiveness, and tactics. The reputation of the Abarusura is mixed. It really depends on who they were facing. If we're talking strictly in terms of military exploits, when it comes to their neighbors, the Abarusura came to be feared. And this is worth noting given the reputation that Banura soldiers had come to have in the pre kabalega era. During that time, it was well known that Kamarasi never retaliated when Buganda raided his country. It was noted by explorers such as John Speak that many Banyoro women, children, and cows were brought back as slaves after each raid into Banyoro. But not the men, though, because they killed all the men. In fact, Buganda came to be known as the land of the wild dogs, Muawa, constantly attacking and picking off their neighbor. By the time of the 1869-1871 succession war, Buganda backed Kabalega in his ascent to the throne, the hope being that they could control Bunyoro, because as much as Buganda was hostile towards them, Kabaka Mutesa needed them to be a buffer state between him and the voracious Sudanese Arab slavers and the Egyptian Empire of Equatoria. The succession war left an already weakened Bunyoro state in an even more fragile position. And as Kabalega licked his wounds, he was reluctant to attack Buganda during much of the 1870s, mostly as a sign of gratitude. But little by little, they grew in strength. Growing in strength, by the way, during a time of constant attacks from various sides, Samuel Baker, his Egyptian crew, the Arab slavers, and Buganda. But by the 1880s, Buganda began to be terrified of the Abarusra. This fear actually annoyed Henry Morton Stanley, who had been given a group of Buganda troops to escort him to Lake Albert in Bunyoro territory. And they said, nope. <laughs> the soldiers refused to go any further. This newfound courage angered Buganda, who, according to Doyle, were determined to humble an overconfident opponent. They attacked over and over and over again. Even Pasha mentions this when he visited Bunyoro in 1885, saying that the Buganda are forever and ever making raids. So much so that Eman Pasha tried to mediate between these two regional powers. He, of course, failed, but Buganda suffered multiple losses at the hands of the Abrusra, namely the Battle of Rangabi, which only happened because a young Kabakamwanga was convinced that Bunyoro was going to ally with the Egyptian Equatorial Empire in order to destroy him. He was wrong. He sent a large army headed by Kangaho Chibirango to invade Bunyoro and they were sent running back after Kabalega himself shot dead Kangaho Chibirango. The Abarusra were able to expand their influence to small estates such as Toro, Busongora, and Kitagwenda. None of them dared to fight back with the exception of Kitagwenda, 
It was for this reason that they were all the more willing to do anything to be rid of Kabalega, including agreeing to British terms in the hopes that they would take back their kingdoms from Kabalega. Okay, now, against foreign forces, the Abrusu were not as effective. This, of course, was because the, the opponents were not only better trained, but had far more superior weaponry. For example, against Lugard, they stood absolutely no chance, owing in large part to his Gatling gun. Same thing when they faced Colville. He was armed with two Hotchkiss guns, three Maxim cannons, 15,000 men, 14,000 of them were Baganda, a thousand were made of six companies of Sudanese and a few Europeans. Against such odds, it was no wonder that they stood no chance. Now, you might wonder, well, what about the large number of guns that they owned? Well, let's talk about that. You see, despite Wignoro having a lot of guns, the reality was that most of the guns they had were of poor quality. Like, I mean, they were deliberately sold guns that were worn out, obsolete military surplus, and specially made trade guns. In his book, East Africa, Tribal and Imperial Armies, Chris Pierce talks about how in 1845, a Birmingham writer called out the city's gunsmith for exporting to Africa in quotes, horribly dangerous guns made of unfit iron. These weapons cost five shillings to make compared to the 16 shillings that it took to make a good quality musket. To make matters worse, copycat factories popped up around the world that made inferior versions of well-known guns. These were then sent to Africa. Even in those days, the continent was being used as a dumping ground for low-quality products. This also helps to explain why the Banyoro were such poor shots. On top of the lack of gun training, the low-grade gunpowder they used created low muzzle velocities, meaning that the bullets they fired weren't as fast as they should have been. As a result, Chris Pierce tells us that the African soldiers would attempt to compensate by putting in more gunpowder. This was incredibly dangerous, as it not only risked bursting the barrel, but also the recoil from this could cause injury. As Austrian explorer Ludwig van Honel had the displeasure of experiencing, he was nearly killed by the unforeseen recoil. He apparently swore to never again use a gun loaded by a native. Now, on top of adding more gunpowder, African soldiers also shot high to make up for the low speeds. The thinking being, by shooting slightly higher, the bullet can travel at an arc, covering more distance, and thereby landing a shot on an enemy who's further away but this made it very difficult to hit the target. Against the well-trained, well-equipped, and experienced Sudanese soldiers of Equatoria, you can see how the Abrusra would struggle against them. Chris Spears also mentions in his book that the introduction of guns replaced an effective spearman with an ineffective musketeer. He goes on to say that most of the damage done was actually inflicted by the Ilango spearmen in their employ as opposed to the expensively equipped Barusra. Wow. The Langi were Bunyoro's greatest military ally, and they were also more feared than the Abarusra. But that support ended when they suffered a major military defeat at the hands of the Maganda general, Gabriel Chintu, in 1890. After this defeat, the Langi refused to send any more troops to help Kabalega. I should note, though, that even though a lot of the guns they owned were of poor quality, they still had some pretty good quality stuff. Henry Morton Stanley noted that they dropped several well-made cartridges as could be prepared at Woolwich. But do not count them out, because given the odds that they faced, the Abrusa were remarkably durable. An example of this was when Chukula's division faced off against Major Owens in 1893. As I said before, it took three hours of hard fighting before the Abrusa retreated north of the river Kafu. Another example was at the Battle of Kazumbera in 1895. While the Banyoro inflicted little damage to the British, the battle ended with the death of Captain Dunning, and Major J.F. Cunningham ended up being shot in the bum. During this battle as well, the Banyoro employed remarkable skill and adaptability. They formed stockades along the shore of the Nile and built trenches to protect themselves from the heavy machine gun fire. Their downfall, though, was the British use of artillery fire. It must be pointed out that even though the British had the upper hand in terms of weaponry, access to ammunition and soldiers, Kabalega and his Abrusa were able to stay in the fight for up to a decade. I know I had said six years before, but actually the Banyora had been fighting the British since 1890 when they fought Lugard. 
this was impressive and surprised the British who thought that this was going to be a slam dunk and win. And as a result, many became disillusioned and didn't see this fight as a real war, where the normal rules of engagement applied. This resulted in increasing cruelty against the Panero. One British soldier wrote in his diary that by shooting the Banyoro, he was giving them a taste of civilization which they were trying to resist. I could list many more examples, but I've already talked about the destruction of the British Imperial forces in episode 8. Instead, I'll leave you with an observation by a military source that described how bad things had gotten. Open quotes. The time-honored war with Kabalega had left Banyoro almost a barren wasteland, and we scarcely saw a native anywhere. With the exception of a few who lived near Masindi, those who had not been exterminated were in arms under their king, who was at the time across on the right bank of the Nile. The desolation on all sides was most depressing. The little gardens and plantations were rank with weeds and completely deserted, and the few wandering natives we met looked half-starved. During the few marches before and after the Kaffa River was crossed, no food of any description was obtainable. Close quotes. Now, as far as formations go, the Abarusa usually fought in columns. Nyakatura describes a formation used by Kabalega where he had the Abarusa fight in the middle and the Awesang as their armies on the left and right flanks. But due to the increased use of guns, they soon changed that and began to fight in ranks or lines. This is another example of the adaptability of the Abarusa. They learned from their mistakes, and after a few disastrous frontal assaults, they realized that in order to survive the heavy machine gun fire and mortars of the invaders, they had to avoid all frontal attacks. As such, they adopted a policy of harassing British forts randomly, using the element of surprise. Ambushes became the bread and butter of their attacks. Lugard wrote that the Banyoro were famous for night attacks, although this isn't really mentioned by others who engaged them. In fact, Doyle tells us that they didn't like to fight much at night, most notably with Baker when he was attacked at night on his retreat from Banyoro. But had they done so, he would have been finished. Prior to each ambush, the Arusa would make a certain bird sound as a signal for a charge. Baker and his men came to recognize it, and it gave them a brief moment to prepare. But I also imagine that it probably caused more paranoia within an already paranoid group. As such, the soldiers began firing at shadows, wasting the little ammunition they had. The Banyoro also used the environment to their advantage. They realized that Baker didn't know the area well enough, so they attempted to confuse him by running ahead of the group and making false trails. These false trails would lead them to an ambush. The Abrusa would set up ambush sites at places where Baker was supposed to pass, like at river crossing and trails. In one instance, they cleared a field up ahead just so they could get a good run-up to launch their spears. Other times, they would throw them from tall grass, which hid them from view. All the soldiers would see was a rain of spears coming down on them. They also stalked the group and picked off stragglers. Kabalega Zabrusra used guerrilla tactics that they were just not able to handle, using hit-and-run attacks, forcing them to give chase until they were tired. This over and over again. Kabalega also began to use scorched earth tactics in an attempt to drive them out, something that the British had been using. But two can play at that game. Even though they were outnumbered and outgunned, Abrusra tactics were able to even the odds a little by making it a battle of endurance. The threat of losing for them became very real. And yet, Kabalega managed to maintain his professional army and the support of his allies for almost a decade. This, of course, provided him with safe bases from which to operate from. He did this even after the British had managed to separate him from his commanders, cut off his access to weapons from the Zanzibar coast, and made life difficult for his allies. He fought a defensive war against incredible odds, and it is this that makes Kabalega one of Africa's greatest military generals. In fact, I'm surprised that not a lot of people know about him outside of Africa. Okay, let's talk about the Abruzzo's reputation at home in Bunyoro. There are two points of view here. When it comes to their foreign military exploits, Kabalega and his Abrusra were praised. However, when it comes to their domestic affairs, they were not very well remembered. The first part, we know, they brought back glory to a decaying kingdom. But domestically, they were considered pretty oppressive. They were accused of just taking whatever they wanted, harassing the population, and even extrajudicial killings. I should point out that they also acted as a state police, their reputation at the job ranging from effective to absolute scoundrels. 
when your historian Gianni Acutura wrote harshly about them, the Italian Cassati did the same. It's particularly telling given that they're called Abarusra. The word Barusra has a double meaning. Imrusra can be used to describe a child who is aggressive. Also, if a child is eating a meal very fast, as the Banyoro put it, as if the meal is going to run away, that child could be called Imrusra. And indeed, an informant to the historian Zoigwe described the meaning of the word Abrusra as a strong wild animal tearing away at the flesh of its fresh kill, a lion ripping the flesh of an antelope. Which reminds me of this god-tier meme, the psycho dog man. I came out into the front yard and the dogs were across the boat. And as soon as they saw me, they came bounding over. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, this guy, with his perfect imitation of a rabid dog, would be considered Emrusra. But it can also be used to indicate that someone is courageous, brave, adventurous, and manly. In this description, it's about the machismo. So at home, they weren't particularly liked, and apparently, Cabalega did very little to stop them. To his credit, though, it is pointed out that the Abrusra would be punished if a case was brought before him, before the king. However, few dared because why risk retaliation from them? It was known that the Abrusra got back at those that they held a grudge against, in particular, the rich chiefs, those of the old era. Cabalega's military forms cut down the power of the chiefs, their armies, Obwesang, were not center stage anymore, and this resulted in feelings of discontentment and friction between these two groups. The Obwesang armies were used to bolster the Abrusra forces. Some of these chiefs were harassed and killed, but as I said before, if they were caught doing this, they would be punished by death. So the question then remains, well, why would they act this way? Uzoigwe explains that since they weren't paid a salary, they had to rely on plunder to survive, and when they were not out on excursions, they plundered their people. Another reason considered was that the Aburusra had helped Kabalega ascend to power, much to the chagrin of the chiefs who didn't want him. From that perspective, it suggested that perhaps he didn't want to rile them up and leave himself defenseless. But that explanation is swatted away when you realize that many of the major Aburusra commanders were actually his friends. Maybe the fact that they were his friends made him overlook a lot of the army's faults? It's hard to say. So probably what he was really doing, at least as is suggested by Uzoigwe, is that he was using the Abarusra to keep the aristocracy in check. Well, that is all for today, everyone. This marks the end of the Ibunyoro series. The next series of episodes I'm going to work on is Busoga. Um, That is my tribe, so I'm pretty excited. Uh, Stay tuned for that. I'm also planning on turning these into YouTube videos. Um, I'll announce that on the podcast Instagram page uh, when I'm ready. Uh, So that's going to be the Instagram page TWCBU pod. Again, that is TWCBU pod. And I'm also on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, All you have to do is just type in the podcast name. uh, Those who came before us and I'll pop up again. Thank you for listening and peace.